Hey wizard, in this video, I'm going to talk about this beta coefficient and how it relates to the volatility ratio over here or what the difference is between the two and also a bit about position sizing. So thank you to the wizard who asked to cover a bit about this two videos ago when we spoke about the Kalman filter. So here we are talking about it now and I'm going to do this just at a very high level in terms of how I understand it, but feel free for those of you who have more experience using the beta coefficient to jump in. So this will just be done the way and the level I understand it in very, very simple terms. So let's first start with looking over at the overall stock market. So here I'm gonna take the S&P 500 and I'm gonna compare it to Tesla. Right, let's go and pull that data and you can see indeed here we have the S&P 500 and then here in this pink line, we have the cumulative returns of Tesla. And so when you compare these two things together, immediately you will notice that Tesla is far more volatile, right? So Tesla here is going up and down, it's going crazy. Whereas here, the S&P 500 is sort of just chugging along nicely. And we can see that here with this volatility ratio, first of all, that Tesla is indeed more volatile. So the way this is calculated is it looks at the historical volatility of Tesla and divides it by the historical volatility of the S&P. So it's always taking asset two, dividing it by asset one, meaning asset two, i.e. Tesla, is four times more volatile than the S&P 500. That's what this is saying. Pretty straightforward. I don't need to spend too much time on that. But then we have this beta coefficient calculation here. So what is that really saying? Well, the way I like to think about it is it's saying Tesla is very sensitive to the movements of the market directionally. So if the overall returns of the market are shooting up by, let's say, 5%, probably what's happening is Tesla's going up by 10%, double that, because we have a beta coefficient of 2.16. It doesn't mean that Tesla is identically following the movement of the market. It means that in terms of your risk allocation, if you had 500 million to manage in funds for stocks, and you're predicting markets are gonna go up, they've been low for a while, interest rates are dropping, liquidity's coming in, and you wanna be you know, risk on, then you're gonna to want to put money in Tesla given the choice or more of your capital or at least a portion of your capital to Tesla because the odds are if the markets do rise, Tesla's gonna rise more. It's gonna rise by more. Same thing as if they go down. If this was a negative beta coefficient, so if the markets were gonna go up like this or did go up like this, then Tesla would go down far sharper. That's what a negative beta coefficient would really look like. So that's quite interesting in itself because what that tells us is Tesla, which is you know, moving a lot in, in, in terms of it's very sensitive to the market movements, is very, very high risk as well, but the returns are also high. So high beta coefficient can mean that your returns are potentially much higher, but so is your risk. And so here, what we could say is, well, let's say we are managing that 500 million worth of stocks in the market, and we are now risk off. Well, we might want something more like Procter & Gamble. So if we look at Procter & Gamble over here, we'll see that that's 0.37, meaning that there is barely, but there is you know, some sensitivity to the overall market movement here from Procter & Gamble. Its volatility is about the same. And so to explain that, I'm actually gonna pick on a cryptocurrency now as well. And I'm going to try to stick with something quite aligned to the analogy with the stock market or the example of the stock market. So let's stick with Binance US. And here I'm gonna pick Ethereum and I'm gonna compare Ethereum to Chainlink. So if we now look at Ethereum versus Chainlink, we'll see we actually have a beta coefficient of one. So this is like a one for one. It's like Chainlink moves like Ethereum. That's how I look at this. It's like if, if Ethereum's returns are going up 5%, Overall, Chainlink's return should also go up 5% or down or whatever, but it's, it's sensitive with a positive number. If, if Ethereum's going up, if this was negative, that would mean that Chainlink would typically be going down in terms of its returns. So that's how I'm looking at that. The volatility ratio is 1.55. So how can that make sense? Well, the reason is if Chainlink's volatility spikes, if it incurs some sharp spikes up or down, and up and down, I should say, that basically averages out to be overall the same cumulative 
returns. That's really how I look at that, understand it, interpret it and read it. But if I go back and look at 550 days worth of data, we can see that's largely, you can actually see by the movement here, that's largely accurate. Chainlink has these tendencies to spike. I mean, we can see here in recent months, we've seen a huge spike going on. So if we actually just zoom into that, you can see it's sort of just trading normally. And then all of a sudden, boom, we get that spike over there. So if I go back to the original example I was looking at, the first thing you'll notice here is the spread. So the spread is right up here now. It's at this, it's, you know, it's starting to get quite toppy. If this, for example, was going to shoot up a bit more. So what I'd want to see here is, you know, I'd want to see that going up a bit more and a positive Z-score. I'd probably look to short this pair, meaning I'd want to go short on asset one and long on asset two. And it's that way around because of how this algorithm was built. When Z-score and spread is like shooting negative, you're typically going long on this one and short on this one. Conversely, when it's the other way around, you'd go short on this one to short the pair and long on this one. So what that means here is I'd go long here and short here. But now I'm looking at this beta coefficient and I'm saying, okay, given the beta coefficient, how much capital should I put into this trade? So let's say I was going to trade this now. Let's say, for example, you know, spread shot up, Z-score shot up. And this is really a great opportunity to go short. After all, we can see just straight off, straight off the bat, just from back tests here that this has performed extremely well from a back test perspective. Now, very quickly, side note on back tests. For those of you who are newer to trading, back testing is, as Marcos Lopez de Prado says, not a research strategy. Feature importance is more on the data science side. But my point is, just because something made 305% when you back test it in the past, doesn't mean it will. And also this is assuming, you know, the price, the prices were exactly per the historical candles, price data, and that you traded them at that same time. And actually there's a lot of assumptions in back testing. So remember back testing is just to be used for directionally, was this a good pair? or wasn't it and why? And so what this tool gives you is the insights as to when the trades were placed here, because you can see here when, for example, the Z-score was spiking, when we were in and out of positions, and you know how did it look overall? But now if I am looking, just to bring up our example here again, if I am looking to go short here and long here, and I wanna know how much capital should I deploy, I could consider using something like the beta coefficient. The first thing I could say is, well, Typically, this asset should move, you know, in line with how this one has. So if this one starts going up, but this one doesn't, I'm like, well, typically it does based on the beta coefficient, not massively, but, you know, there is some positive beta coefficient here. So this would be a great time to look at going long on here and short on here. So that could be one. The other part is position sizing. So I could look down here and say, okay, what if I took, let's assume I have $100 to trade, right? So what this assumes is you, you're putting $50 in IMX and $50 in SKL. That's what this down here is assuming you're doing. So if I'm doing that, and the reason it's saying uh, here, if I drag this up, it's actually gonna represent how much I'm putting in IMX because that's the ticker I'm assuming is being traded as the primary you know, ticker one. So if I swap that round, it'll actually have the opposite effect you'll see over there. So there we go. So what I want to do is say, all right, how much do I want to allocate to IMX? So out of my 50, do I want to give 60 to IMX? Do I want to give 40? Well, actually, because this is slightly less than one, I might decide to allocate more to SKL. And when I do that, you'll notice here, my net return goes up, my sharp ratio goes up as well. But I take this with, again, a pinch of salt because most of those returns happened here from this snapshot. So let's just cut that off and see down here. Okay, so we can see we've got now, what is that? That's some ridiculous return number. It's like 500% return. So still, it made a lot more. Now, this doesn't mean go and allocate 75% of your money to SKL because it's also 33% more volatile. It's 1.33 times more volatile than this one. However, at least I have these numbers to weigh up to consider, okay, based on why I'm entering the trade, so maybe I'm entering it as, you know, it didn't move by the 0.65 that it could have done over a period of time. I want to see if I can arb that. 
that's one reason why you might do it. Another reason here might be just overall to see directionally how much or where would I want to sway my money towards? Because you can have a look at the peaks and troughs and whether your sharp goes up or down. I would say the most important number here to look at is actually your sharp ratio. Because that's saying for every dollar of risk I'm taking, how much return am I taking? And actually we see that even though it's a more volatile asset, as I favor the returns more of SKL, I'm getting a better sharp ratio. And that won't always be the case. This is not a hard rule. That's why this tool is developed. And for those of you who are nerds like me, the reason why this backtest runs so fast and it is running in real time is because of Rust. That's part of why we changed the um, tech stack. So again, I'll talk more on that on Code Raiders, but I, I love playing around with this. Just be careful though, because this is not a correct calculation. It's not correct in the sense that the only way it's doing this is it's saying, okay, if the returns, for example, on the historical data were 50%, or no, let's, uh, let me not use 50%. Let's say the returns were 1.2% on a given day. If I'm allocating now, you know, half of the capital that I would have done to that particular asset, like I am now, then assume the returns were actually, instead of 1%, or whatever I said, they're now half a percent. So that's really what's going on over there. It's just a way to gauge how much value would I have captured given that I would have put more capital in another asset or not. It's not a bulletproof way of looking at this, of saying, you know, how would the position sizing have worked? But it's a very quick way to get directionally. Would it have made sense to put more money in this asset or more in the other asset. And so that's how I'm looking at that here. I'm not qualified to give you advice on this. I don't trade for a living. I code for a living. So please be careful how you go and approach this, but at least here you have some objective data you can play with to help with your decision-making. Anyhow, I hope you found this valuable and until the next one, take care and talk soon.